Thank you, Erin. You got it. Um, I'm delighted to be able to introduce our speaker this evening. Um, I met Frederic Lavoie-Pierre when she was the Director of Education at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. And she held that position for several years. And before that, um, I don't know if it was immediately before that, but at some point in her past, she um, was part of the faculty of Sonoma State University where she helped to found a sustainable landscape uh, professional certificate program. And she also has a history in the um, nursery industry itself. She ran an organic nursery. Um, I believe it's specialized in culinary herbs and um, edible plants. She may touch on that, I'm not sure. But she clearly has um, a lot of uh, background um, as a practitioner as well as an educator. Um, she has a master's of, um, degree in science and Part of her research was studying the interactions between plants and insects, which um, makes perfect sense when um, you think about the book that she um, has written and will be talking, um, talking to us about this evening, culminating from many, many years of writing articles for Pacific Horticulture Magazine about that very thing, about the living organisms that um, visit our gardens, um, some that we want, some maybe that we don't, but all the stories associated with them. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing her presentation. So take it away, Frederic. Frederic, we don't hear you if you're speaking. Okay, unmute. Aha, uh -huh, there you are. Okay, good. And um, let me see. Okay, so let me get this going. Slideshow. They can start. So can you see my screen? Yes. How lovely. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for inviting me this evening. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Carol. Um, so I just want to point out before we get started that I have been really privileged to work for many years with the artist who did the illustrations, Craig Latker. Uh, he's contributed uh, over 150 drawings over the years, including many new ones for the book. And this right here is a brand new drawing he did for what will be our next book, which will be about how to create habitat. And um, that's probably some years down the road. Uh, I always credit my photos. If there isn't a credit there, then that is a photo that I took. I uh, don't always use scientific names in my talk. And so let's get started. Oftentimes when we think garden allies, we immediately think pollinators. And while I'm going to talk about pollinators this evening, of course, um, I am also going to talk about a lot of the other roles that insects and some other organisms play in our landscapes. Um, these right here are longhorned sunflower bees in this illustration, um, by the way. So I am going to be delving into some science, but first I wanna show you some more of these pretty pictures as I kind of let you know about what we're gonna be talking about this evening. So I always start with life beneath our feet, uh, the soil. Then we will move on to uh, all these illustrations, by the way, right now are in the book. The only new one that's not in the book is the first one. And I'm going to talk about flower visitors, which is pollinators and a few other things. Digging deeper is a little segment talking about uh, parasitism. We're going to meet the beetles, or at least a few of them. There's a lot of them out there. Garden commons is like that drawer in your kitchen where you throw everything, you're not quite sure where to put it. And so here are just some familiar insects. We're going to check out the ground crew and beyond. So uh, a few things that are going to live on the, in the soil that are not insects and um, some things like bacteria and galls. And then finally, we're going to look at vertebrates. And now we're going to just dig into some science for a little while, and then we will get back to some um, pictures. 
So this chart I adapted a long time ago from uh, UC Davis, IPM. And uh, this is their basic concept of integrated pest management. And you're probably familiar with this already. We're trying not to use uh, conventional pesticides. And it is a decision support system, but it's based on cost benefit analyses. And it was really developed for farmers and for people who are working in commercial systems. So as gardeners, it, we tend to think, eh, I don't wanna to go to conventional pesticides. Um, so I kind of stop around biological control and uh, that is what we're going to talk about. So um, integrated pest management is really about minimizing risk to us and to the environment. And there's three kinds here of biological control. Classical biological control involves releasing insects or other organisms for permanent control of a, a pest. The augmentative biological control, you again are releasing insects or some other organism, but you're only expecting temporary control. And the third type, conservation biological control, which is really my focus and the focus of the book, we're attracting and establishing populations of natural enemies of undesirable insects and other pest species. Now we're gonna take a slightly closer look at these. So this is usually what we're thinking about when we think biological control. We're thinking about introducing and establishing a natural enemy of an introduced pest. And the father of biological control in this country, Charles Valentine Riley, worked for the US Department of Agriculture. And around the turn of the previous century, 1900s, there was a devastating insect that came in and was attacking citrus and almost ruined the citrus industry in California. And this was the cottony cushion scale in this lower photograph here. And Charles had the idea that he needed to find out where that insect came from and to figure out if it had possibly a natural enemy. And um, his boss was actually not thrilled about him taking a little vacation to Australia. So instead, he tasked an employee of his, a staff member, with going to Australia to attend an exhibition with a secret mission to find the insects that attack the cotton cushion scale. So they came back with the Vidalia beetle, which is very effective and saved the citrus industry, and also a little parasitic fly that's actually more effective in um, coastal areas. But it turns out that this is actually quite an expensive um, way to treat pests in the garden. We know now that when you're introducing something to a place where it isn't native, it can become a problem. And specifically with insects, we have a risk of host switching. It's especially a problem if we're trying to control a weed and say you bring in some sort of weevil to attack it, um, you don't want it to then move on to a desirable plant. So it's very expensive. They have to do a lot of testing. And of course, then they have to raise the insects and it's also expensive to purchase them often. So not ideal for us as gardeners. Augmentative biological control. This is what you're doing when you buy ladybugs. Um, and I'm gonna ask you, please don't buy ladybugs. Um, you look at those little mesh bags and underneath you see that little black confetti on the ground. Those are ladybug legs. Um, and not only that, but they're really not very effective for a variety of reasons. So augmentative biological control, you're really using ladybugs here as a biological pesticide uh, because you're not expecting them to stick around regardless of the strategy that you may be using. Um, even if the control is by the offspring, they're not gonna stick around to continue reproducing. And so, um, here we are with conservation biological control. And so we are preserving and enhancing our locally resident natural enemies. And we're expecting to get permanent control. Some of them may be non-native. There are a number of um, parasitic wasps, especially that have been really wonderful. They've been introduced to agriculture and they're ubiquitous now. And we're simply grateful for that. This is the only approach to controlling 
insect populations that is going to create a positive feedback loop. And um, the, the more you apply this method, the more wonderful natural enemies you have, the more natural enemies you have, the fewer pests you have, and the less you feel like you need to use pesticide of any kind, organic or not. Um, and so you're using two major strategies, reducing pesticides, I actually should say, and patients. Um, and you're gonna provide resources for all of these different things that live in the garden. So there are a lot of ecosystem benefits to controlling pests this way. Um, and all of these come into play. But really what we're trying to do, uh, we hope, is to make sustainable landscapes and to benefit the society that we are living in. So uh, I want to talk just for a little bit about native plants. Why native plants? Of course, you probably know, um, Santa Barbara Botanic Garden is all native with Theodore Payne. And I am a big fan of native plants. I think everybody should be. Um, but I'm also pragmatic and I'm a gardener. And so I have plants that also are not native. Um, but let's talk about the natives and they are really supporting our ecosystem health. And um, I, I do think I've stopped using the term California native because we have such a huge state. And as you know, what is native in the Mojave Desert is not the same as what is native in the redwood forests on the North Coast. So now I use the term regionally native. Um, and while I'm not a purist, I always like to throw in a caution about non-native plants with berries because oftentimes birds will spread those. So we have to be a little careful. The reason that native plants are so important is because of co-evolution. And um, Paul Ehrlich, who was a entomologist and Peter Raven, who was a botanist, actually wrote the original paper on co-evolution sitting at a coffee table. They were comparing the close relationship of speciation between their butterfly species and these associated plant species so that the evolutionary trees looked the same. They could be matched up. So their paper, Butterflies and Plants, a study in coevolution, really should have been called Caterpillars and Plants because that's what it was about. It was about the larval foods of the butterflies. But they are just as biased, even though they're scientists, as the rest of us, and butterflies sounds prettier. So what happens, and we are using a monarch caterpillar because we're also familiar with them. And as these caterpillars feed on the plants, the plants gradually, over time, become more toxic. And then the insects that are feeding on them have to overcome that toxicity. And they um, are evolving together then in what is called an evolutionary arms race. And this back and forth between the plant and the insects that want to feed on it leads to speciation and specialization. So a lot of herbivorous insects are linked with certain plants, quite closely linked. And, um, but you also find that oftentimes predators and parasitoids of these herbivorous insects are also fairly closely linked to their prey. So the bottom line is that native plants are just superior in supporting biodiversity. Um, and so we need these insects that feed on plants. And, um, all these other animals and organisms that rely on them. So the best reason of all for native plants is to provide food for plant feeders. And I know that seems somewhat counterintuitive at first as a gardener, but um, you know, all food begins with the energy that is stored in plants. And all animals are relying directly or indirectly on plants for their food. And so these herbivorous insects are critical because they're releasing the embodied energy in plants. Plants are really not that digestible. Think of an oak leaf. Um, so these, these insects are either converting the leaves into something that can then be further digested by say bacteria, or they are being themselves fed upon by birds and other animals. So you might think you don't really like insects, 
I know people don't sometimes, but everybody loves birds. So um, if you think you don't like insects, at least plant for the birds. 96% of our terrestrial birds are feeding their young arthropods, insects and other related species. And 70% of them continue to eat arthropods as adults. So we tend to think of birds as seed eaters because we're always putting out bird seed um, or growing plants for seed. But um, actually half of their diet is Lepidoptera. So that is the um, caterpillars of moths and butterflies. And as we've learned, they're very closely related, um, closely tied to the native plants. So it's all connected, right? And you tug at one little thread of the food web and it reverberates throughout that entire web. And so this word biodiversity has become something, it, it's a term we throw around, I think without always really understanding what it means. So let's take a closer look at that. Biodiversity, usually what we're thinking about when we think about biodiversity is we're thinking about species richness, which is simply the number of species present. But you can right away see that, well, if I only had one of each species, that wouldn't really be a healthy biodiverse environment. It also matters what the abundance is, the number of individuals of each species. So that's more important than just species richness. And the other thing that comes into play and leads us to talk about functional biodiversity is that it isn't just richness and abundance, but the identity of these species and what the role is that they're playing. And by the way, this is a um, ladybug pupa, if you've never seen one. And um, so this leads us to insurance species and high functional group biodiversity. What this means is that, um, so I really like things that eat aphids. And um, there are several different species of ladybugs that eat aphids. Um, hummingbirds also will take aphids to their nestlings. And um, I've seen lizards feeding on aphids. So there's all kinds of critters out there. So if you lose one species of ladybug, say, uh, you still have some others that can step in and play that same role in the environment. And that means that your garden becomes really resilient to disturbances and change. And that's a really important thing because we're gardeners and so we're always disturbing the system in some way. There are a lot of factors that promote biodiversity, uh, whether you are in wilderness or in a garden, but these all happen to be features of gardens and it is more difficult to apply the principles of conservation, biological control in an agricultural system. And especially as monocultures get bigger and bigger. And um, that's one of the reasons that uh, so many farmers have become interested in hedgerows where they can promote biodiversity. So let's talk for a couple of minutes about how insects are feeding on plants. These are all pollinators. And I know we don't typically think of pollinators as plant feeders, but they are. They're, e they're gathering and eating pollen and nectar. They just don't do damage. And by the way, see this milkweed over here, which is our native California milkweed. That is a tiny, tiny little bee there, a native bee um, on that flower. This is usually what we're thinking of. Right. Oh, look at there's some raggedy leaves. Although it was hard to find these caterpillars, um, these were on madrone. And insects feed on plants, of course, in all kinds of ways. They mine, they chew, they bore. They're in the twigs. They're under the bark. They're eating roots. They're sap sucking. It, it, it's kind of a wonder that the world is green at all. Um, and so insects in general, by the way, very good at hiding, okay, because they're tasty. Uh, so you don't always notice these herbivorous insects. Now, in the case of these corkias, you can certainly see, oh, these are damaged and there's little ovals cut out. These were done by leaf cutting bees and they are collecting lining for their little solitary nests. Well, they're also important pollinators. And so this always brings me to this idea of, well, are they a pest or are they beneficial? 
And I really try to think, and I've mentioned pests several times already, but I try to not think about most of these garden organisms as being a pest or a beneficial. I try and think of them in their role in the food web. Is it a predator? Is it a parasitoid? Is it a decomposer? What, it, what role is it really playing? And I will say now, sometimes we do need to intervene. And there are things that are pests in our garden. And there are certainly non-native injurious insects with few natural enemies. And climate change is definitely having some impacts and making some of our native insects behave as pests. So I don't want you to think that I welcome everything indiscriminately. Um, but I am trying not to use the word pest as much. So um, that is um, a lot of our science here. And I'm going to dip into the book now. I'm kind of loosely following the structure of the book here to introduce you to just a few of the garden's denizens. And there's plenty of overlap in these categories because nature is well, sort of messy. This, by the way, is a little sand wasp. I really like them. They're often kind of blue and black, kind of cute. So I'm gonna do a reading from my book. It's the only reading I'm gonna do this evening. <coughs> The air into which plants extend their stems, leaves, flowers, and fruit is a virtual desert compared to the soil in which their roots seek anchorage, water, and nourishment. This is why the health and sustainability of any landscape begins with stewardship of its most valuable resource, the soil underfoot. Soil is not simply a canvas on which we paint our beautiful plant picture, but a living substrate. A good gardener before anything else tends the soil, the foundation, of the landscape. We think that we are growing plants, but really we are growing soil. When we proudly show off our prized tomatoes, we could just as proudly show off a handful of the fertile soil from whence they came. Fertile soil includes a complement of humus, organic matter that is decomposed until it has reached a stable state. We have many garden allies, seen and unseen, to thank for that, because without them, soil is just crushed rock. As Leonardo da Vinci remarked long ago, we know more about the movement of celestial bodies than about the soil underfoot. It is still true today. Just about every available surface under our feet is teeming with life. Incredibly, even the thin film of water that coats soil particles and lines pores in the soil harbors microscopic organisms that navigate those minute spaces. Fascinating stories emerge from the soil. And um, I do tell a few of those in the book and let's see what we will talk about this evening. So these are a couple of the, I call them unnoticed life because if you're looking really closely, you can see a pseudoscorpion, which is a little critter on the right here with the naked eye. And you can also see the columbula, which is over here, it's a little spring tail. Um, and sometimes those appear in huge masses. This particular drawing here um, is the only one that wasn't done by Craig Lacker. It was done by my friend, Jim Nardi, who wrote this wonderful book, Life in the Soil, A Guide for Naturalists and Gardeners. Um, I love his book and highly recommend it. And it, it always seems amazing to me every time I see this particular illustration to think that there is this much life in one cup of native soil. I mean, 100,000 meters of fungi 200 billion bacteria, it boggles the mind. Now here's something a little bit bigger, earthworms. Um, earthworms, a single earthworm, by the way, can produce 10 pounds of castings in a year. So they contribute hugely to fertility, although they are not native. Um, we welcome them in our gardens and farms. Um, they will accelerate decomposition and the tunnels that they create are making channels where roots and water and air and nutrients can penetrate. And this is why I am not a fan of tilling my soil. And um, I, I just keep adding compost to the top and let the earthworms do their work. This is an earthworm egg over here on the right, by the way. Then I'm going to talk for a moment about new excuse me, decomposers and nutrient facilitators. 
these are often exactly the same thing. And a lot of them are invisible, but the soil is going to seem absent of life if they aren't there. Things like bacteria, protozoans, and uh, actinomyocetes from which we get uh, a number of our antibiotics actually is the thing that contributes that humusy, foresty smell that you enjoy. So a lot of these are contributing to the health of our soil, but we're going to move on fairly quickly here. Um, these that are technically falls are the nitrogen fixing nodules on a legume plant. And when those nodules decompose, they will release nitrogen then for a subsequent crop. So on the wing, flower visitors. So uh, originally, and my editor thought I was going to write a chapter on pollinators, but there are so many insects that are visiting flowers that my preference is to think about these as flower visitors. Um, and I'm going to talk just for a moment about um, flowers as a resource because so many of these flower visitors are relying on um, nectar and pollen as a food source. And so it's really important that they be able to access that nectar and pollen. So yeah. flowers that are fairly open, um, not those super, super doubled flowers where they can't reach anything. Um, we look for things flowering over a long season. It's easy for you all down in Southern California. Um, a lot of insects are looking for a patch of something rather than a single plant. Uh, I wanna put in a good word for wildflowers. They are fantastic resources. And I look for things in just a few families really for most of my resources. And that would be um, the aster family, parsley family, <coughs> mint, mustard, and the rose family. And then we even have some of these wind pollinated plants like oak and willow are still providing a lot of really important pollen. Um, willows actually also provide nectar although they're wind pollinated. Nature's complicated. Let's talk about bees for just a couple minutes. These bees were in my front yard here on the left. These are long-horned sunflower bees and they're solitary nesters. And the females really have no use for the males beyond reproduction. And so the males sleep outside in these little clusters and they were always, they'd come back to the same flower stem every evening. And my neighbors probably thought I was a little crazy there out in the yard every evening with my camera. But bees are the only insects to purposely collect and carry pollen. And that is one of the things that makes them so important as pollinators. They are the best and most important pollinators. But another thing is that they have branched hairs and those branched hairs have an electrostatic charge. They are like pollen magnets. There are over 4,000 species of native bees in the United States. Um, 1,600 of those at least are native to California. And a lot of them are important in arid areas. So you have a lot of native bees in Southern California. 70% of them are solitary. 70% of them are ground nesters. And that's not, of course, necessarily the same 70%. Most are stingless or can't penetrate human skin and only females can sting because the stinger is a modified ovipositor. The same is true, by the way, of wasps and ants. <coughs> the moths and butterflies, we tend to think about butterflies when we think Lepidoptera. Um, and that's because butterflies are out in the daytime and they're colorful and a lot of moths are very tiny and brown. And of course they're out at night, but actually only about 10% of the Lepidoptera are butterflies. And most butterflies, you will be shocked to learn, are actually not very good pollinators. Uh, a lot of them perch high up on the flowers. Uh, monarchs come to mind right away. And, you know, they put the, the little straw-shaped mouth part down into the flower. And um, the skippers, which are kind of in between, the little orange and brown moths you see bopping around the garden there, their larval host plants are grasses. 
um, they are actually a bit of a better pollinator. They're fairly hairy and they get down into the flowers. Um, so we're going to move on. And we're going to talk about hunting wasps for a moment because all hunting wasps are actually flower visitors. And we were going to look at the parasitic wasps um, in the next um, section. At any rate, we are going to define these hunting wasps as insects that can catch and carry off their prey. And a lot of them are solitary. The adults are feeding on nectar, sometimes on pollen. And the wasp larvae are carnivorous. Right? So they're feeding on whatever the hunting wasps are hunting, oftentimes spiders or true bugs or um, caterpillars. And um, bee larvae are differentiated also because they are herbivorous, feeding just on the nectar and pollen. So these wasps are going to paralyze their prey and stop the nest and the larvae actually eaten alive and the vital parts are eaten last. Um, and we are going to move on now and meet a couple flies. This is a little tachinid fly on the left here. Most of them are much, much more bristly than that one. And it's a flower fly on the right, a surfeit fly. This is one of our best friends in the garden, is a hover fly. And let me tell you, if you're a small flying insect, you don't like wind. So if you want a garden full of insects, it's good to think about some wind protection. So um, a lot of flies are nectar feeders and flower visitors as in their adult stage. And it is only the larval stage that's doing the work. In this case, the tachinid is a, um, is a parasitic insect and its larvae are parasitizing uh, the prey that we will talk about that in a minute. And the surfeit fly is laying eggs among the prey that the larvae is going to eat instead of directly on it. So, by the way, surfid uh, larvae look like little green slugs or little brown slugs and um, people are tempted to kill them, don't. This here was sent to me by my friend Phil Van Solen who um, had a nursery for many years up here in uh, Northern California. And he sent this to me and said, what is this? This is a surfeit fly on a California stream orchid, Epipactus gigantea. And, and like many orchids, it has weird pollination mechanisms. And the surfeit fly climbs into the orchid and the orchid slaps down on its back these little packets of pollen called pollinia. And it, I love this photograph because it seems to me that this fly has a very heavy load. I don't know how it's going to go anywhere, anytime soon. So let's dig a little deeper into predators and parasites. This is a robber fly here. A robber fly is a really ferocious predator. It will kill and eat many individuals over its lifetime. And so it's a predator um, and um, avoiding Predation, by the way, is really a strong selection mechanism. And it is, a, as I think I mentioned already, a reason why so many of these herbivorous insects are so great hiding. And so here's a couple of flies here, um, the tachinid fly. And this is a bee fly over here on the right. And they are both flower visitors and they are both parasitic. So what's the difference? Well, a parasite is on or inside its host, and it's usually far smaller than its host. And it rarely kills the host. Think of diseases like malaria, for instance. And it's usually bound to a single host, and it could move from one host to another host as larvae. And there are a lot of very complex parasitic life cycles. But when we talk about insects, we often are talking about parasitoids. Parasitoids can be much larger than the host, and they may live on or inside their host. And the key is they always have a free living adult stage. They are not bound to a host. And they're almost always insects, usually flies and wasps. 
So uh, there are, of course, always exceptions to everything in nature. And so they almost invariably kill the host. Oops, wait, I wanted to mention one other thing here about the bee fly, Bombyliidae, because it parasitizes ground nesting bees and wasps. So again, the nature's a bit complicated. It's behaving as a pollinator, but it's also parasitizing some insects that we would welcome. And they are egg flingers. They fling their eggs at the opening of a nest. So I've never seen this happen um, in person, but I'd like to. <coughs> So wasps. Wasps are some of our tiniest allies. I actually don't have any photographs of the very tiniest ones. Uh, long ago, I took my collection of parasitic wasps into the California Academy of Sciences. And Dr. Zuparco, who is a specialist on these, and especially aphid parasitoids, said, oh, these are big wasps. And let me show you some tiny ones. And he pulled out a microscope slide. And under the cover slip, there must have been 50 tiny little specks. And those little specks were wasps. And I realized that day that sometimes I'm out in my garden and I think that those are dust motes floating around my flowers and they're actually wasps. Um, some of them are even parasitizing butterfly eggs. Okay, So there are egg, larval, and pupil parasitoids. Um, and egg parasitoids, of course, are the very best ones because then that uh, insect never um, hatches. So let's meet the beetles. I'm kind of checking on my time here. Um, this is an ornate checkered beetle, and they are very conspicuously colored. They eat other beetles, and there are a lot of them are flower visitors um, and eat pollen and insects. And the clarids are actually pretty interesting to us and research is being done because of their potential to attack bark beetles. A lot of beetles like late summer blooms like goldenrod and yarrow. They like clusters of little flowers, um, but they also like early blooming um, bunch grasses, for instance, and they thrive in leaf litter and under stones and logs. So their habitat requirements are a little bit different than just flowers. So here's a lady beetle um, and we're familiar with these, you know, red and black polka dotted lady beetles, but there's a lot of other species too. This is a mealybug destroyer over on the right and the adults are tiny. And the adult, I mean, excuse me, the larvae looked remarkably like the mealybugs that they prey on. So this is a classic story of the wolf in sheep's clothing. And it is easy to see these and to think they're a pest and think that you should kill them. So look closely. I actually really love um, butterfly binoculars, but a hand lens can also be very handy. So there are dozens of species of lady beetles. Only a few of them are available to purchase, but you can attract a lot of them by having a garden full of flowers. The soldier beetles are related to blister beetles and fireflies. So you have to watch out for some of those um, little cards that have, you know, beneficial insects on one side and pests on the other, because they will put the um, blister beetles on the pest side, but in fact, soldier beetles look a lot like blister beetles. One of the keys for me is that if I see a lot of some kind of insect, um, oftentimes that is behaving as a bit of a pest, and but you won't see beneficials in as great of quantities generally. Um, so these are one of our very best garden allies and they don't talk about them a lot in agriculture because the larvae are in soil and they tend to pupate in leaf litter. And um, so they don't really thrive on farms, but they are fantastic in our gardens and they prey on other insects as both adults and larvae. They prey on aphids, caterpillars, grasshopper eggs, mites, other little insects. Um, I have seen an unconfirmed rumor that they uh, like to eat cucumber beetle eggs, and I can't vouch to that other than to tell you that I have not had cucumber beetles create issues for me in a long, long time. Here's a predaceous ground beetle. 
This one is easy to recognize because look at the size of those mandibles. And so they are abundant, but they're nocturnal and they're quick and they're dark colors. And we tend not to see them unless we're moving a flower pot perhaps. Um, so these are family carabidae. They can quite closely resemble the darkling beetles that are eating plants and are in a different family. But the darkling beetles are herbivores. And so just like a cow, they kind of move a lot slower. Um, and so you can tell them apart just by their behavior. Um, but these carabids will eat their weight in prey daily. And they prey on caterpillars and beetle grubs and grasshoppers, and even some of them on snails and slugs. I always like to show you leaf beetles so that I can bring us back to how useful insects can be in weed control. Um, and so these are Klamath weed beetles and they are preying on uh, Klamath weed, on Klamath weed, which is St. John's wort. It's a toxic rangeland weed. They've been extremely effective and also kind of pretty. Um, and we have found that we ha also have some weevils that we can use for things like star thistle. So here we are at the garden commons with our familiar garden insects. This is an ambush bug. I love ambush bugs. They look like little dinosaurs to me. You can look for them on golden rods. And um, so this always brings me to what is a bug. I use the word bug fairly liberally uh, to refer to all kinds of things. But a true bug, which is just one kind of insect, is distinguished by having piercing, sucking mouth parts. And um, they actually are really great food for all kinds of other critters. Um, and they are also very good at protecting themselves through camouflage of various kinds. Um, they masquerade as things and mimic um, things. They um, often have physical and chemical defenses too. This is called aposematic coloring when they're you know, red and black, they're warning colors, just like bees and wasps have warning colors to tell you back off. And you can see the mouth part folded back underneath this bug on the right here. And you can see that it's sticking into some other hapless insect on the left um, with this predatory bug here. And so then we have these homopteran groups. Um, we used to have uh, um, two, two different divisions. And then we found out that these homopteran groups actually not closely related. But I like to look at them together because these are our most problematic garden insects. Scale insects, white flies, aphids, mealybugs. A lot of them produce sugars that are attracting ants. And that's the story you see on the slide with the ladybug. Because here's the aphids and the ant is hurting these aphids. This is its little herd that's producing sugar. And ants are ferocious and they, are, they will protect their herds from anything that tries to attack them. So oftentimes your first line of defense when you see that you have these homopteran groups attacking a plant is to see if you have ants. And if you do, control the ants. And then the predators and parasitoids can come in and do their work. And a lot of things like to feed on aphids. Yeah. Frederick? Yes? I'm just letting you know that it is 8.30 right now. Okay. Um, okay. We're gonna take a, you can keep going, but afterwards we have our door prize. So if, okay. you, if everyone who is participating can still stick around for a little longer, we'll do our door prize then and okay. announce next month's speaker as well. Thank you, Frederic. I will tell you that I actually am getting close to the end. And um, so I want to tell you that, that the Odonata, the dragonflies and um, damselflies, actually fantastic predators and they're beautiful to watch. They, um, as far as I'm concerned, dragonflies are an unrecognized hero. They will eat their weight in mosquitoes daily. And then we have the musicians, the Orthoptera. And so there's grasshoppers and crickets, and they are very important food for uh, birds and other animals. And as a result, many of them are really good at disguising themselves. 
katydids actually can be omnivorous. And then the mantises, not related to grasshoppers, but they're related to cockroaches and termites instead. Our native species are the best and generalist predators, but a lot of the egg cases you buy, of course, are the Chinese mantises and males compete with our native mantises and it's really better to try and attract our natives. Here is an insect that is actually worth buying and introducing to your garden if you don't have them, which is lace wings. The adults are nocturnal and you might not really have noticed. The adults are nectar feeders, uh, but the larvae are voracious predators, both uh, green and brown lace wings. The ground crew and beyond are, um, include here spiders, but in the book also snails and slugs, galls and pathogens. Um, and other non-insect vertebrates. Um, and again, we have an herbivorous millipede on the left. So it's a slower moving critter. And on the right, you have a centipede, which is a hunting predator. And so it moves quickly. Uh, they're really great in the garden. Don't pick them up and you won't get stung. Um, don't be afraid of spiders. Most of them can't pierce human skin. Most of them are fantastic garden predators. And as you can see here, they are really beautiful sometimes as well. So a lot of spiders, by the way, are not quite as generalist as we think, but they can be quite picky in their prey. High and low, vertebrates. There are plenty of vertebrates we don't want in our gardens. I don't welcome deer, personally. Um, and of course, they have a lot of different habitat needs um, in terms of water features, shelter, brush piles, um, rocks. And um, so that, that's the next book. Um, amphibians, of course, are very sensitive to pesticides, yet another reason to reduce them. And frogs and toads eat their share of bugs and slugs. Um, reptiles. If you have a rattlesnake in your garden, there are rescue organizations that will come and relocate it. Other than that, snakes are really a fantastic uh, thing to have in your garden. Birds, of course, some are going to nibble on plants. I've had my peas all annihilated more than once, um, but mostly we welcome them with bird baths. And um, they, here they are, you know, here's this... Um, oak bush tit eating insects, or actually I think it's gonna feed them to its babies in this case. So what can you do? Um, you can put up a bat house. You can plant native plants in your front yard and be an example to your neighbors. Be observant. It's amazing how much you can see. I think I mentioned butterfly binoculars, the close focusing binoculars. Visit gardens and see what's going on there. And this is from the Davis Arboretum, this sign. Um, but you can learn a lot from visiting gardens. And um, these are just a couple more. This is a swimming pool I really liked. Lots of natives, lots of flowers. Master Gardeners, one of the biggest volunteer organizations in the country doing fantastic work. Join or volunteer at your botanic garden, native plant society, school gardens really need you. Um, join iNaturalist if you haven't played with it. This is a fantastic way to get your insects identified. Also, I use bugguide.net um, and you may even discover something new as did Bonnie Nickel. Turn off the lights. Um, a lot of insects are nocturnal, birds are nocturnal. Um, look at how lit up we are. Darksky.org has got some fantastic information. Plant natives, I might have mentioned that. And finally, I just want to say here, when we tuck at a single thing in nature, we find it attached to the rest of the world. This is the beautiful meadow at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. And um, the book. There is a website coming soon. Um, I am occasionally on Instagram and more often on Facebook. And, um, oops, there we go. Thank you. Thank you, Frederic. Sorry, I went a little over. No, you're fine. Okay. And thank you to everyone who has stuck around with us as well, a little after 
the half hour mark. Uh, we are going to get into the wheel of names, but before we do, I want to give a, another big thank you to Matt for his presentation today, and for everyone who contributed plants to the plant forum as well. And our next webinar is going to be on Thursday, May 12th. And if you were here for the announcements, you saw that it is what are cultivars with Bart O'Brien. So keep an eye out on our website for the registration link for that one, because it will be a really good one as well. And now we will do our wheel of names for a copy of Frederic's book. Give me one moment. All right, let's see who's here. M, are you with us? And if you are with us, raise your hand. I don't see Susie M, so we're going to do this again. <laughs> Helene or Helen, are you here? Oh, I see a different Helen, but not Helene. All right, we're going to try this again. Third time is the, the charm. <laughs> Anne, M N. M. I, I'm so sorry, I just messed that up. Ann M. I do see you here, so I will be reaching out to you. Congratulations, Ann. And we are going to continue with our Q&A. So we did get a couple of questions. Oh, Frederic, you are answering them already. You're on mute right now. I put an answer to one of them because I didn't know if we were gonna have time, but I will tell you about this other one because it happens a lot and I talk about it in the book. Monarch caterpillars getting parasitized. Yes, it's pretty gross. The fly larvae emerge from the chrysalis after the chrysalis turns black. Oh, actually this is a different one. Okay, they, they will emerge from the caterpillars. Um, so yes, tachinid flies, and, um, but I try not to think of it as a widespread problem, but just part of the food web, and you are going to lose some of your um, monarchs. It's normal. It's part of the selection that happens out in nature, but it is gross. <laughs> Thank you, Frederic. And then you also did answer another question already, which was, how do you recommend controlling ants? the arginine yeah. ones in particular. Yes, and they are a huge problem. They have multiple queens. You may have heard there's a super colony so that they don't actually fight each other. And so you have to keep after them. I usually use taro, it's a boric acid bait, uh, but there are other things you can do. And you know, I like to recommend people in Southern California refer to Greg Rubin, who has written a ton. You probably had him speak to the society. If not, he would be a good one to get. Um, and he has a lot of ideas about controlling Argentine ants and the horrible damage they do. No. They well, pray. thank you, Frederic. Yes. Uh, those are the only two questions that we've had come in. And if anyone else has any other questions, please feel free to write them in the chat or in the Q&A section. Frederic, we have had a few people already say thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the ant control tips. It's uh, always fun. Always a wonderfully fun. informative evening. So thank you so much. Thank you. And we had uh, Laura said, love the talk. I could listen a lot more. <laughs> oh, good. Wow. Um, so yes. Definitely. Well, you know what? There's a lot more in the book and um, it is hard to know sometimes where to stop talking. <laughs> Well, thank you, Frederic, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. If you have to leave or if you missed the first part of this meeting, right. we will have it recorded and posted on our website um, at least by the beginning of next week, if not later this weekend. And uh, Frederic, we did get one last question from Magda. 
Is there a danger of newly introduced control insets taking over beneficial ones? Hmm. That's a good question. It's not something I've ever um, worried about. Well, I try to. I don't introduce insects that aren't native to my garden. So um, th there's that. I don't. I try not to do that. So I'm not sure if that answers the question. All right. Well, if, and yes, Magda says it does answer. The oh, okay, question. good. Thank good. you. Okay. All right, everyone. We'll have a wonderful evening. Frederic, you as well. Thank you again for your time tonight. And thank you everyone for joining us. We will see you next month. Okay. Thanks. You got it. Bye. Bye.